Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode. Today, I have a very special guest here with me, uh, Dr. Wesley Wong. How are you doing, Wesley? Good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to do this. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Um, with Wesley, I was, I mean, obviously, he has uh, a lot of followers on Instagram. Um, he's doing a lot of things for our uh, physical therapy community. So for me, reaching out to him, uh, I, had to, I had to think about it a lot. But um, I'm really glad that you're here with us today. So, yeah, um, there are so many things that I want to ask you. So let's get started here with uh, a question. Um, healthy baller is where you're working, right? Mm -hmm. So from what I understand, it's a cash-based clinic and you're working with athletes um, and helping them through their rehab process. What do you like the most about your job? Um, to be honest, pretty much exactly what you just said, uh, at least at our facility now, I get to work with the exact demographic that I want to work with. Um, you know, I went into PT school, I got hurt playing basketball, so I always wanted to work with athletes. Um, at my previous two jobs out of PT school, it was, you know, a more traditional model and, you know, I had total knee, total hip, shoulder replacement, all that kind of stuff. And then I would get the occasional athlete, maybe one at the end of the day. And I knew I always wanted more and at least a healthy baller, like, 90 to 95 percent of my patients are athletes or active adults um so it's literally just the exact demographic that i want to be working with gotcha and is that something that you pretty much knew all along or is that something that you figured out um during uh pt school that you wanted to work with that specific population uh i always knew i wanted to work with athletes I just was never sure in what capacity, you know, I think a lot of people going to PT school and the dream is like, I want to work with professional athletes. And there's like, I want to work with professional athletes all the time. And, you know, now given that I've been at healthy baller for a little over two and a half years now, like I work mostly with high school and collegiate level athletes. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get the occasional pro athlete. Like I just finished up with a WNBA player who's now in the bubble now. Um, so it's, it's like, I, I, I do get those as well. And, and it, it was fun. You know, she was like, she's a normal person and it was, mm -hmm. she went to my alma mater too. So we were, we were in college at the same time. So it was really cool to talk about that kind of stuff. But at least for me, I, I'm really big on the relational aspect of it. And I think it's just working with high school and college lab, college level athletes. It's a little bit easier. Um, so, you know, I didn't know exactly the type of demographic. And even then I didn't even go into PT school with the idea that I was going to specialize in ACL rehab. It was just I want to work with athletes and even then I feel like a lot of students in and younger PTs don't really understand what it's like to work with athletes uh, it's something that I talk a lot about and it's just understanding the demands of them uh, demands of the sport demands of college sports uh, it's, it's a whole world that I've had to learn during my time at Healthy Baller um, so okay. that's kind of a long answer for your question oh no I, I appreciate that um, and I appreciate you sharing that perspective uh, I kind of wanted to go a little deeper into what you said about um, it's not something that you might expect, um, you know, working with athletes. A lot of us as DPT students have that vision, um, or, or some of us do at least, um, that we want to work with athletes. Um, what is something that really, I guess, startled you or surprised you in working with athletes? Was it something that you expected it to be when you first really started working with them? Um, so, you know, my first two jobs, again, more traditional model. I thought I understood what it was like to work with athletes. You know, I saw, you know, occasional ankle sprains, like small muscle strains and things like that, you know, stuff that is honestly pretty easy to treat, you know, and a lot of these will kind of just get better over time as well with a little bit of treatment. But then you kind of get into the more complex injuries. Like I, I consider an ACL a pretty complex injury. It's, it's very, it's, it's hard to overcome or someone who has like chronic low back pain or a grade three muscle strain. Um, like these are the ones that, in my opinion, require a higher level of treatment. Um, you know, it's just, you, you see a lot of, let's say a soft tissue injury and a soft tissue injury ends up becoming a second one or a third one. And then they're dealing with this for, you know, three, four, five years of playing a sport. And I think that's the part that I really didn't understand was the demands, the, the, the rehab has to match the demand of the sport. Um, and our job is to prepare them for their sport. And it's not just getting them back to 70% and be like, oh yeah, you, you can do the rest of the way. It's our job as real sports PTs to get them back all the way back so that when they step back on the field, they're like, I'm good. I know I'm good. And I think that's probably the biggest gap that is missed when working with athletes is not understanding, not, o not only not understanding their sport or the demands mm -hmm. of the sport, but also understanding how we can help them get to that, reach that demand or reach that threshold basically. And, you know, and that's where a lot of the strength and conditioning background comes into play. 
or learning how to do, you know, like reactive exercises and understanding how to build up to reactive exercises. Cause you can't just start, you know, from ground zero and go straight to reactive exercises. There has to be a thought process behind it. Um, right. So all these, all these systems, these rehab systems that have, that I've learned through these past two and a half years, have really just been honestly extremely eye opening. And then you talk about the collegiate level as far as sports goes, it's like, learning about the run test, learning about their lifts. And then if they're rehabbing athlete, like how is it going to fit in with all that? And then the time management of like, oh, I got to go to practice at 6 a.m. and the lift at 8 a.m. and then class for four hours. And then we got uh, like another lift later in the afternoon. But it's like, how am I, how am I going to squeeze my rehab in during that time? Um, so there's a lot of that aspect too. And then I, I guess the last thing is the the politics behind working with college level athletes too is because – when you're when they're at school, they're under the, the care of the athletic trainer. Some schools mm-hmm. have PTs, but the majority of schools are under the care of athletic trainers. And then they come home, and I have a different philosophy of doing things. You know, particularly for ACR rehab, I kind of have a set way of doing things that I feel is is best. Not to say I'm right, but that's just what I've learned along the way. And mm-hmm. if it's very very different than the model that they're experiencing at colleges, which at least in my experience it is. Um, it makes it really challenging because they go back, they work with me for the summer, they go back for two months, two and a half months, come back to see me for a week for Thanksgiving, and then gone again. You know what I mean? So it's really hard to work with college level athletes. Um, sorry. And the last thing I'll throw is that when you, if you really, really, truly want to work with like, like athletes, particularly during the school year, like you better be willing to work until like seven or 8 PM because they got to come after school for high school level athletes. Um, so the grind of, of being a sports PT is, is something I really don't think a lot of students really grasp. It's like, are you willing to forego a specific lifestyle uh, in order to have this kind of quote unquote dream job? You know, like there are days that I don't get home. A lot of days I don't get home until 8 30 PM. So I eat dinner really late, um, mm-hmm. you know, and just having to, to be on that grind. But it's, it's a, it's a different world that I think is not really talked about a lot. Um, you know, I think a lot of people call themselves sports PTs when they work in a more traditional model. But if you have two or three athletes a day, that doesn't really make you a sports PT, you know? Right. No, for sure. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Cause I feel like, um, it's good to have access to this kind of information, but it's not always easy to reach out to individual sports PTs to ask these questions. So that's pretty much the purpose of my podcast is to have, to share this information with a lot of people because you guys are doing great things. And um, I'm thinking if a lot of people, a lot of DPT students know about what you're doing, we can kind of set ourselves up for success when it's our time to start working in the industry. So, so thanks for sharing that. And I also had a question about um, you mentioning how is sports rehab is very sports specific, right? So um, you can't obviously have um, background in all the sports out there. And I see you working with lacrosse um, players. I see you working with soccer players, um, rugby players. Is that something that you continuously educate um, yourself on? Or is that something that you just had your background in, uh, background uh, information in? No, definitely not. Like I, I grew up playing basketball. Um, I played some like, you know, intramural flag football and stuff like that too. So those two sports I understand and I watch those sports on TV the most. Um, but it's funny cause the girls that I say girls, cause that's mostly my demographic, but the ones I work with now are mostly lacrosse and soccer. You know, I grew up, every kid pretty much plays soccer at some point, you know, but it's a very basic understanding of it. Um, mm-hmm. but then you talk about lacrosse and the movements are very specific. It's very different. Um, but I just learn, you know, I, it's one of those things that you ask questions and I think it's okay to ask questions. And I don't know if as a new grad or a student, it's kind of like you, you're afraid to ask questions because you feel like it makes you lose credibility, uh, which I understand because I was probably in that same boat. But now it's like I, I work with a field hockey player and I've never seen field hockey. You know, I, I, I know it's a stick and a ball and that's pretty much it. But understanding their specific type of like like lateral lunge type of movement and sweeping motions that they have to go through, it's so different than like any other sport. I think the cross was a lot easier for me to pick up because a lot of the movements and the way their defensive structure works is a lot like basketball where it's like it's zone or man, you know, I was like, I can, I can pick that up. Um, it's just obviously the rules that are a little bit different. Um, so the movements for lacrosse, I was able to pick up a lot easier, but then you, you talk about a sport like field hockey, you know, I just asked her questions. Like, can you show me what you need to be able to do? Like if she's, she was hurt at the time. So I was just like, can you just like walk through it and just show me how to do it so I can figure out how I can, incorporate that into your rehab exercises so I can, so that that way, that way it'll help you gain confidence, you know? Um, right. So I, I think for, for any young clinician listening to this right now, like, don't be afraid to ask questions. Like it's completely okay. It doesn't make you lose credibility. 
um, at, at all. If anything, it, sh it should show that you care more and that you're willing to like, like push yourself a little more outside your comfort zone. Um, and also just like, honestly, like pulling up stuff on YouTube, like watching videos of how they move, like that's education right there as well. Yeah, uh, I really respect that because it's not like as PTs were complete. It's not like we know everything, right? So continuing to educate yourself on some of the things um, that can benefit you as a clinician, I think is very important. Um, so now you've mentioned um, sports specific, how it can be sports specific. And I really like that about sports PT. And there are some great things about it. And I guess my question now is, what are some of the things that you see in the industries, um, specifically cash-based clinics, working with athletes? What are some of the things that we can improve upon to really um, go above and beyond with this? Because I know it's relatively new. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think like I've been graduated for, you know, it seems like a long time, but I've only been graduated for five years now. And even then, I think there's just the whole social media world of like Instagram, like that was not around when I was in school, but now it's it's like everybody has a PT Instagram now, which is cool. Um, so I think there's a lot more accessibility to information and there's a lot more like cash PTs like me and Teddy and Alyssa who are like doing this, you know, we we, we, we try to present it out there. And I think the, the major benefit for a cash-based facility is that you're not confined in a certain sense to the way to a specific way of treating and that's how i felt at my last two jobs where i was working under orthopedic surgeons and it's like here's the protocol you have to do it this way more or less um and there was no like inspiration as to like getting creative with certain exercises or just like learning how to load athletes um like my last couple of jobs we didn't it was they were pretty decent sized facilities but you didn't have space to actually like do stuff like I couldn't cut, I couldn't sprint, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, best thing you do is like maybe take them in the hallway, but it's like, it's kind of like weird to run the hallway. It just doesn't feel quite right. As opposed to like running on turf, you know, it feels very real. Um, and also even just equipment wise. Um, and, and I know there are a lot of like, like insurance based sports PT places out there. We have a couple that we have good relationship with this area that we refer them to because not everyone wants to pay cash, you know, and we understand that. Um, so we, it's our job to still get these athletes as good care as possible. Um, so I, I think turf space is obviously very necessary. Um, I think equipment is huge. Like my last facility, the heaviest weight we had was a 10 pound dumbbell and a 15 pound kettlebell. And like, you're not loading anybody at that weight, uh, at least well enough, you know, to, to get them back to playing a sport. Um, and I think for us, we like, I'm able to spend an hour with every single patient. And I feel like that's a, it's a priceless thing. And I think a lot of times, even especially with my ACLs, I'm like, you know, I, I could easily spend an hour and a half with you and it's, it's not a problem. And a lot of times I do keep them for an hour and a half just to have them finish up with doing, you know, a half hour. And like for, if you compare that to like where I used to work, it, it would be impossible to even have a meaningful hour and a half session, but for an hour and a half for, for my, for my athletes right now, they're, they're exhausted, you know, they're done. Mm -hmm. And that's how it should be for ACL rehab. It's a grind. Like I'm, again, I'm preparing you for your sport. So you should feel like you got a really, really good workout and that you're sweating. Um, and I don't care if you are, you know, two weeks post-op. Like if you're two weeks post-op, we're going to figure out a way to make you have a good workout. You know, obviously we can't do a ton with the knee because it's so fresh, but range of motion, quad, all that kind of stuff. But like, why can't I have you do a core circuit? Why can't I have you sit down on, on a box and do battle ropes? You know, why can't I have you do bike sprints with just your arms? You know, anything to get an athlete moving. And that's the kind of like, I guess, stuff that's, that's still continue on. Like I said earlier with sports PT, like these are the stuff that I, I feel generally starts making a big difference to be like, oh, I can still come into a gym. I still get to feel like an athlete, even though I can't even run right now. Um, and that's the stuff that psychologic ends up making a big difference. And, you know, a lot of my athletes will come in from other facilities and be like, oh yeah, I was, I, I never felt like I was able to do things that were required for my sport you know i was always doing the same thing that the 70 year old woman next to me was doing and she has a total hip replacement and it's like what does that do to the psyche of an athlete um you know they, they, they might lose motivation they might feel like this is not really benefiting me and that's you know that, that that's tough to, to deal with when you're a younger athlete um so i think keeping them motivated keeping them moving keeping them strong is, is a big process as far as that recovery goes okay that's that's really interesting to think about it that way um we the psychological aspect of rehab is very important, yet it's not always um, prioritized. So thanks for bringing that up. And let's uh, briefly, or it doesn't have to be brief, but we, I wanted to touch on the ACL Mastermind Group. Uh, from what I understand, it's an online platform, an online community that you've created 
for athletes that have injured their ACL. Uh, what was the motivation behind that? So the Mastermind Group is actually a educational platform for mostly like uh, PT students, PTs, trainers, you know, strength coaches, athletic trainers, things like that to offer like an educational background as to how to treat ACLs. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, you know, ACL, like treating ACL should be a specialty. You know, every month, basically, I get some kid that comes to me from a different facility and their knee is like completely messed up because they just weren't given great quality of care. Because, you know, nowadays, it, again, I think back to when I was a new grad, you know, first ACL that I ever got, it was like, cool, I finally get an ACL. And then it's like, do I really know how to treat an ACL? But then you're just given this protocol, which is three pages long, that tells you exactly what to do, boom, boom, and you just follow this thing. And I vividly remember looking at this piece of paper and being like, zero to two weeks, okay, I got to do this, this, and this, this. And that, that guided my treatment. And then two to six weeks, I was doing this. And that is not how ACL rehab should be because everyone progresses really differently. Um, so that alone, even just with protocols, I, 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 I really dislike time-based protocols just because, you know, I, I've seen so many ACLs now and they, no two of them are ever the same. You know, there's, there's, you could have one kid that's really, really fast and you have one kid that's just like, who's not that there is a lack of effort, but they're 12 weeks and they're nowhere near jogging. And then you have someone who, who at 12 weeks can just hit it and, you know, start jogging right away. No problem. Um, so at least for me, I think that there needs to be a lot more education surrounding the ACL, surrounding ACL rehab, which is why I decided to start the mastermind group about a year and a half ago. Um, I, again, I was thinking back to my, my when I was younger and I was like, you know, I really had no one to ask questions. Even I felt like my coworkers at the time didn't really know how to do ACR rehab either. Um, and I, I was like, there needs to be, there has to be something out there. And there really wasn't. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to carve out that niche for myself uh, in person and also in the online spectrum in, 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 on Instagram. So I decided to start the group. And at the end of the day, even though it's called the ACL Mastermind group, it pretty much applies to like lower extremity rehab period. You know, someone could have a severe quad strain or whatever it is. And it's just, you know, it, at, New content gets for me, I, I add it every two to three weeks, you know, about eight videos or so every two to three weeks. So at this point, it's close to 250 videos. Um, wow. there, there includes like, there's a lot of stuff with like breaking down certain things. It's like, I, I have case studies about like, oh, how, what should you look for if someone's doing a simple exercise, like a forward heel touch. It's a very common exercise. Um, and it, it goes all into even more advanced stuff. You know, we've, I've been able to learn, I'm fortunate enough to learn movement specific stuff from my strength coaches at, at our facility. So like, you know, there's something called a T-step, which is basically just a lateral transition. And it's like, you, no student is ever taught to do that in PT school, you know, but it's just, but like, how do you get a kid to start doing a lateral cut? Or how do you get a kid to do a cut in the first place? There's, that's never taught to us. Um, so that was my whole process or behind my thought process behind starting the mastermind group. I just thought that it was a, a worthwhile thing to do. You know, I try to make it very reasonably priced. I, I understand there's students in this group and I wasn't trying to make it, you know, like 50 to a hundred dollars a month or anything like that, which is why I priced it at $15 a month. And I was like, that's like a planet fitness gym membership basically. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, I try to make it very reasonable and just understanding that I, 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 I'm doing this to try and provide a platform for, for people who are really, really interested in learning about ACL and lower extremity rehab and understanding like, Oh wow. Like there is more than just two quad exercises. There's more than just two hamstring exercises learning how to teach tempo to people, learning how to program for people, you know, and, and also on top of that, there's also a private forum group is that like, when you do feel lost as a clinician, which is going to happen to all of us, even for me, five years out, I have plenty of questions. This gives me a, a platform to be like, oh, I can ask trusted people about this on this platform. Hey, I have this girl who's five months out and she's just not progressing very well. Does anyone have any ideas? And then boom, people, people will give you answers. Um, so, you know, for me, I, I looked around, there's really nothing like it. So I was like, let's just start this thing. Let's get, let's get it going. And we're currently at like 170 some members. So it's been, it's been really good. Wow. That's awesome. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. Um, and then I guess with creating online communities like that and people being more accessible nowadays, just like I, how I reached out to you, uh, for this interview, um, and PT community is very tight. And from what I understand from other podcasts that you were part of, um, you and Teddy, your coworker, you guys were able to connect through Instagram. That's how you got your start at Healthy Baller. So do you think connections, making the right connections and networking is a big part of our PT community? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And even just thinking back to, you know, we hired Alyssa Simone's about a year ago 
and she reached out to me on Instagram, which is like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in the area. Like I live pretty close. Like, can I come chat to you guys? And that, that was the start of our relationship. You know, wow. and that's exactly what I did for Teddy. Um, I, I think it's a matter of like finding people who are receptive of it, which I think most BTs will be and just being respective, respectful, sorry, when you are there. Um, so like we've had people coming to shadow us and which we are cool with, but understanding that like you can't just come in and like we can't just answer 700 questions for you while we're working. You know, we're, we're still right. working. Like it's cool for you to come into shadow and if the kid's over there lifting and you know, it's just us two, like, yeah, go ahead and pop in a question. Um, so like, you know, respecting boundaries because I think you can make a good impression and you know, I, I, I guess I made a good impression on Teddy when I first showed up. <laughs> um, and that's, that's literally just how it started. I, I, I took a chance. I was just like, if he says no, whatever, no big deal. You know, if he, or if he ignores me, like that's fine too. It, it, it could have happened. Um, and you know, so that we literally, I just DM'd him. Can I come shadow after work? Cool. Come in, pop in for three hours. And then, you know, I came in every two or three weeks just to come shadow him. And then I kind of jokingly was like, Hey, Teddy, if you're looking for a PT, you know, I'm, I'm like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And then five months later we shook hands and that was it. You know, that's how our wow. relationship got started. So it wasn't like I did anything magical. He, Teddy took a chance on, I mean, essentially I, I, I'm a nobody. You know, I, I had no credentials. I had literally just my PT. I didn't have my CSCS. I didn't have any of that stuff. I have no training conditioning background. He just took a chance on me and I'm, I'm forever grateful because of that. And I still tell him to this day that I'm thankful that he took a chance on me. But I mean, he saw something in me. I don't know what it was, but he saw something in me. And, you know, at this, like part of me working hard is to make sure I prove him right, to make sure, like to prove that he made the right decision of picking me when, I mean, with this platform, Teddy can hire anyone, you know? Yeah, that's a great story. Um, and kind of going off of what you said about taking the chances, taking that shot and seeing what happens. What is that a big part of you as an entrepreneur? Because you're uh, doing PT blogs, you have an Instagram account with, you know, 200, I think 44k followers, uh, you have a big platform um, going for you. Is that something that you think is valuable in all entrepreneurship? Yeah. I mean, with, with being a business owner, like you got to take chances, you know, there's, uh, there are plenty of things that I didn't do right my first year. And there's going to be plenty of things that I don't do right moving forward. Uh, but it's just, as you learn, as you grow, you need to start taking more like calculator risk, I guess, you know, like my, my first year, I was trying to spend so much money on, on advertising or like online advertising. And I, I thought, at least thinking back, I thought I wasted that money because I only got like two or three leads from it. Um, and then just understanding like how to, maneuver through a business and how to grow that business without being too like business-like is, is a really challenging task. You know, like for us, our, our business model is, I, I would say we've grown 80 to 90% through road of mouth. You know, we don't have the privilege and most, and most cash bases don't have the privilege of having an orthopedic surgeon own that facility and just do like, Oh, come see me. Oh, you don't need surgery. Go to PT or, or, or you need surgery. Oh, here goes PT to my PT. Cause that's how, what 80% of these, clinics are, are owned that, that are like that, you know, so we don't have that privilege. So just like learning how to hustle, but being kind of respectful in a way is, is important too. And just knowing like, Oh, I can take a chance here or no, this is probably not worth the risk. Um, is, is a big like learning curve that the entire, I mean, entrepreneurship, whatever you call it. And like, it's something that Teddy and I still are like him and I just, we'll, we'll pop on phone calls for like a half, half hour or an hour and just like talk about like, Hey, what are the next steps? Like, Hey, what do we need to do? Should we do this? And you're just kind of talking things out. Um, I think it's an important process of learning, you know, when to do things and when not to. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so we basically reflected on your past and we know where you are. And I know we're running out of time here a little bit. So I wanted to ask you about future plans. Do you have any uh, future goals or any plans that you don't mind sharing with us? Um. So at least for me right now, I'm, I'm very, very happy with where I'm at. Like, I don't plan on leaving anytime soon. Yeah, it's, this is one of those places that like, this is the dream job, you know? Um, I, I never thought that I would have gotten here in just like three years out of PT school, but I'm very, very thankful for where I am. Um, my coworkers, including the owners of Healthy Baller, allow me to have a voice and to express like things that I want, things that I just want, uh, I don't want, and just things that I think that can improve or whatever it is. And um, and like, they're a direct referral source for us. You know, the owner, Matt works with a lot of lacrosse girls. So if one of his girls goes down, he trusts me enough to take care of his athletes. And that's invaluable. You know, I talked about word of mouth, like even though he, he works with us, he's still not going to send people to someone that he doesn't trust. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. And so at least from the work, from 
the physical working realm, like I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'd love to, I, I, my goal is to continue pushing my mastermind group, continue to use it as a platform to help students and help young PTs learn and grow. Um, and then lastly, I think that, you know, I, I'd love for Teddy and I at some, t some point to be able to teach a course, uh, on, on, like a weekend course. Um, we've talked about it here and there, nothing ever concrete, but I just think that there's a lot, I think a lot of students want to do sports PT, but again, don't understand it. And I think for us, we're able to, you know, try and create some sort of condensed two day course of just being like, Hey, this is the big things to look for. Mm -hmm. Um, and as far as like teaching how to rehab, you know, even sort of stuff like I think the most people don't really know how to progress, how to teach an athlete how to cut, you know, it's just like, Hey, go cut. And we're like, uh, but I don't really know how to teach that, you know, but that's important to have to, to help build confidence. And that's, I think that's a big part of what we try to do is like, you're trying to, in a sense, like reclaim the athlete's ability to, to play that sport, you know, rebuild their confidence, rebuild their, their muscles, their, whatever body part is injured. Um, and it's, it's, it's a tough thing. And I think that a lot of places, you know, like including where I used to work, like you just don't have the means to do it sometimes, especially for the more complex injuries. Again, minor stuff, no big deal. You can, they, they can be done. Um, but I think it's a, it's a big missing component. And I think that if him and I were to teach a course, like I feel like it would be kind of exciting to be able to, to move this profession forward. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm super excited for you and, uh, your future plans. And, um, I mentioned this in the DM that I sent you, but it is really motivating to hear stories of PTs, um, that have a true passion for what they're doing right now. So, um, this was a great conversation for me and I hope my listeners um, can learn a thing or two from this conversation. So yeah, this was uh, Dr. Wesley Wong. Um, thank you so much again for your time and I'll see you guys later. Appreciate you having me.